657, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. We'll stand to sing. Thank you. Be seated. Pastor? Thank you for that. Once again, you'll uh, see probably as we proceed, I trust that uh, God has uh, been orchestrating everything. Let's pray together. Lord, you are so very good to us, and we are so very privileged to be a part of your family, to be able to reflect back on our lives, uh, that moment when we 
uh, turned from our sin to embrace the one and only Savior. And in uh, many different ways, heaven did indeed come down. And at that moment, you not only forgave us, but you equipped us with the Holy Spirit of God, which is really the foundational and crucial truth to victorious Christian living. And as we get ready to look into your word again tonight, we are reminded of the all-important part that the Holy Spirit of God plays. And again, to think that he actually tabernacles in our hearts, it's an amazing thing. So we are blessed and privileged tonight, and we offer to you our praise for all that you have done, all that you've done in the past, what you're doing presently, and what you will do in the future. Thank you for entrusting your word to us, and we've already been challenged clearly that we would, first of all, embrace uh, the message ourselves, and then that we would uh, show and say it forth. So help us in that all-important endeavor. And then, Lord, continue to teach your truth to us and stir our hearts and uh, bring us even more into conformity to um, our great Savior, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So be our guide as we look into your word again tonight, we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. The Apostle John, as you know, builds his gospel account of Christ on seven miracles that the Lord Jesus Christ performed. We are making a mini study of these seven miracles. Uh, we have considered miracle number one, Christ turning water into wine. You'll find that in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Tonight, miracle number two, Christ healing of the officer's son. Again, our testimonies tonight, in particular, Brother Dan certainly directly comes into play with this. We find it in John chapter 4, uh, verses 46 through 54. John chapter 4, beginning with verse 46. As you head over there, I'll remind you of our simple approach to these seven miracles. Uh, we first of all will read through the narrative, and then we will simply go back and make some observations, pick up some of the highlights of uh, the narrative. This is with a view to these miracles being familiar to you and uh, with a view to your familiarity with the miracles. We are trying to cover each of these seven miracles in a single session. We'll see how we do with that. So here we go, John chapter 4, beginning with verse 46. Take a look as I read John 4, 46 through 54. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee where he met the, where, where he made the water wine. There's miracle number one. It's neat that the two are combined here. I start again. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son lives. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son lives. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to improve. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the eleventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son lives. And he himself believed in his whole house. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. What, what an amazing miracle. What a powerful display of the Lord Jesus Christ's power. Yea, the fact that he is the omnipotent God. 
the, the miracle, as you can tell, even from a simple reading, uh, very much sets forth Christ's power. But folks, and this is the heart of God's message to us tonight, it's power that is uninhibited and unaffected by either time or distance. Listen to this truth. Divine power that is uninhibited by either time or distance. I mean, the reason why you're impressed with that is because these two things are constantly frustrating us. We are constantly running out of time. We are constantly saying to one another, even by way of excuse, I do not have the time. And oh, how distance ties our human hands. And I'm, I'm telling you, and I, this is my testimony on behalf of not only me and uh, not only myself and Ann, but also Ken and Carletta. We, we couldn't be in a more appropriate place tonight. Forgive me for the personal nature of this. As we Friday watched our kids and grandkids fly to the other side of the world. And we are left with the impression of the Lord of time and distance. One commentator attributed, ascribed that title to Lord, and it's really struck with me, Lord of time and distance. Lord, as in the Greek word, kurios, ruler, the one who rules over time and distance. Aren't you glad tonight that time and distance does not handcuff the Lord Jesus Christ? Aren't you glad that none of it makes any difference? The, the, the very things that are constantly frust, fr frustrating us are, are no frustration to the Lord Jesus Christ and how glad we are for that. And this is one of those miracles. I guess they're all like that, that it certainly was for this nobleman and for this nobleman's son, but it's as much for us. We are so thankful that Christ's hands aren't tied. We are so thankful that he can do his stuff at a distance and that, again, time does not factor in with his work. So we're about to rub shoulders with the Lord of time and distance. you got to love that. Here's a royal official with a dying son. I'm thinking of Brother Dan's testimony tonight. What well, Father, you know, wouldn't say with a view to a dying son, man, I would gladly, without hesitation, take his place. So don't miss the pathos. You know, we're reminded of that again this morning, right? And now tonight, we have this wonderful biblical narrative God has spoken to us and have actually has had it inscripturated. And we have all that we need. And, and yet, because the narrative is often succinct, we know that God doesn't throw words around. It would be easy for us to miss the pathos, but when you really plug yourself in, when you really think about the details that God has given us, succinct as they are, again, your heart is moved. I have three sons through my beloved Anne. I know they belong to her too, but this is the story of a father and his son. I, I can't imagine and again any good father I'm sure would gladly take the place of his dying son I'd say maybe even a little bit smarty aleck hey if anybody's going to do any dying it's, it better be me not, not my son the father is identified as a certain nobleman did you see that in verse 46 and 
Again, we're going to kind of do a little bit of hop, skipping, and jumping. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee where he, was made, where he made the water wine, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. You'll be interested in Greek word, and for those of you that pay attention to words especially, this will probably ring a bell even though I'm not going to pursue it with you. It's the Greek word basilikos. It literally means, I got a kick out of the literal rendering of the term here, it literally means things pertaining to the king. Which communicates to us that this man was part of, he, had, he was in high standing in Herod's court. This is significant, and you remember the, um, the, the inspired writings of Paul and don't you love that, where the gospel goes everywhere. And, and, and invariably, it's where someone unexpectedly is saved. You would think, boy, there's someone in that, and no one in that realm is going to be saved. And then God wonderfully and miraculously saves them. And then all of a sudden, Paul is writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And he's saying, hey, I want you to greet the, greet the folk over in that realm. And I want to greet the folk over in that realm and over here, too. Because they're all brothers and sisters in Christ. How exciting. How exciting that is. And here's a man who's playing some kind of significant role in Herod's court. And uh, he's in trouble. Because his son is in the process of dying. We would assume that he's a gent Gentile, the nobleman a Roman but he's after the Jewish Jesus and we can understand why he's after and ultimately seeking Christ's miraculous help take a look at verse 47 as I read when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea and Galilee went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And then drop down to verse 49, if you would please. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Now here's the remarkable thing in regard to the certain nobleman, probably a Gentile, probably a Roman. He, he has faith that Jesus can heal his son. Think of that. He has faith in Jesus, that Jesus can heal his son. But in his mind, it's got to be right now, which is a reference to time. Remember the Lord we're talking about here. In his mind, it's got to be right now, and it's got to be there where the sick son is. And he's in the process, and wow, does he respond well to this. He's in the process of meeting the Lord of time and distance. And he'll never be the same. So we watch, and this is similar to what we've been observing, you know, even on Sunday morning with the great patriarchs. We, we watch, but in this case, it's, it's succinct. We watch as a man quickly moves from little faith to more faith to much faith. And that's the way it ought to be. So, so initially, he has these misconceptions. They are not misconceptions in regard to and when applied to anyone else, but when applied to the Lord Jesus Christ, they are misconceptions, and that is whatever... Christ has to do, he has to do it right now, and if he is to do it, he's got to be physically present. Again, Christ is about to teach him and us otherwise. And how glad you are, because you have never physically seen. You have never, with your physical eye, seen the Lord Jesus Christ. We are every day and every moment of every day impressed with his spiritual 
present and written on the fleshly tablets of our hearts is the great promise in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5 with its five negatives, I will no, 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 never leave you nor forsake you. And you and I are living and breathing this, but remember the Apostle Peter's words as he wrote under the inspiration of the Spirit of God concerning you and said, him whom we have not seen, we love, we believe, we rejoice, and we receive. Absolutely amazing, but it's all by faith, and we've we sang tonight, it was such a joy. Everything was knit together by the Holy Spirit of God. We sang about seeing Christ, but nobody was, I mean, actually now seeing Christ, but nobody was fooled by that. We weren't singing and testifying to each other and to God that we have actually seen Christ with the physical eye. No, this is the eye of faith. And then we turn right around and sing rightfully so that the day's coming when we are going to see him face to face. Listen, he's real. We're not questioning the reality of him, but we have not yet seen him with the physical eye. We haven't, this is one of my favorite things, we have not actually smelled I don't know if you remember that. It's one of my favorite things. It's the favorite psalm and verse of those like Pastor Tom who have been blessed with big noses. Can't wait to smell him. And in that day, I got some interesting news for you. In that day, you're actually going to be jealous of Pastor Tom because of his smeller. Doesn't this just warm your hearts? He smells of myrrh. Couldn't you just weep? Can you imagine his garments? Psalm 45 and verse 8 is, don't you absolutely love this? Isn't it neat when you come? Now, you and I come up against each other, and sometimes we smell, but it's not particularly pleasant. And sometimes the smell may be intended to be good, but it's just overwhelming. But sometimes we have contact with somebody, and about all we remember is that smell. We say, that was good stuff. Can you imagine the day when you see him face to face? And when you do, you... you instantaneously sense the aroma. This will be your testimony. He smells beautifully of, of myrrh and aloes and kesha. And you'll never be the same. So listen, I know it's the reason why we are in it I almost said we're in it to win it. I think that's okay. We're in it to win it. It's the reason why we're in it to win it, because we know the day is coming when we're going to be able to put our arms around him. We know the day is coming when we're going to see him with the physical eye, when we're going to touch him. Sorry for uh, reminiscing with you in regard to this and maybe taking a few tangents, but I, you, know that I, you know I love this in regard to... John's writings elsewhere where he speaks of having the privilege of having to of having handled the Lord Jesus Christ I mean literally touching him I shared this with you before I remember that was our final assignment in in Greek class to translate through first John can you imagine you open up your Greek New Testament and there lies before you um, the epistle of 1 John, and your assignment is to translate from the original language. And I had trouble getting through the first verse. You wouldn't be surprised by that, but the professor didn't understand. I had trouble getting through the first verse because I was holding back the tears when John tries to express to us what it was like to actually touch Jesus.
and I can't wait. But we are waiting. What a day that will be, but now we see him only with the eye of faith. And so of necessity, listen, this is where we spiritually live and breathe. You and I would be in utter despair if our Savior wasn't the Lord of time and distance. I'll bet you that Carletta could cry out for the next hour and a half at the times over the course of the past um, uh, number of years where Logan and Kendra are expressing their hurt and we're saying, we got to go, but we can't. And then we remember, listen, there's something better. We worship and serve and know the Lord of time and distance. His hands are not tied by such things. And think about all of the things that you and I have received from this one. I'm talking about concrete things. I'm talking even about temporary physical healings. Think about all of the things that we have received from this one whom we have not seen. Right? Wouldn't you testify? Oh, look what he has done for me. Oh, look what he has given to me me and so all of that comes into play with this wonderful narrative regarding this powerful miracle this powerful display of Christ's omnipotence this nobleman traveled about um, by the way one other thing just some Tommy Teal speculation this Nobleman traveled about 20 miles. There's about a 20 mile distance between Capernaum and Cana. And remember, the nobleman has come to get the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, initially, he's thinking, I got to get him home to where my son is. The narrative doesn't say this, but I'm wondering, first of all, how did the nobleman travel to? the Lord Jesus Christ, covering these 20 miles. Well, you can imagine that he was not strolling. He probably came on horseback. And as he comes to the Lord Jesus Christ with the intent, right, and you guys know this, I'm taking him home with me. I'm going to be like Jacob of old. Once I get a hold of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's not leaving until he comes home with me and lays his hands on my son and heals him. And I wonder, it'll be neat to find out someday, right? But I wonder if the nobleman, because he probably would have had the resources, I wonder if not only he rode a horse, but I wonder if he brought a steed for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm wondering if part of the narrative actually is, Lord, we're ready to go. The cab is ready to go, Lord. So there's a drama here that, again, it just is exciting to contemplate, but... The whole narrative then turns around verse 50. So take a look at that as I read. Verse 50, Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son lives. And the man, this is unbelievable, he believes. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken to him, and he went his way. I mean, even us with mature faith, we would have been looking for something a little bit more than that. Lord, could you at least write, write it down? Could you, could you give me your pledge? Could you give me your promise? Is there some kind of guarantee? I've, I've ridden all the way here to find you, and now you're telling me that i got to go back and you're not coming, and yet you're telling me that my son is is living, that he's been healed. Can I have something from you? And all he had was Christ's word. And that's all that he needed. The man of faith 
the woman of faith, the young person of faith, all they need is a word. And oh, how we have been given it. We're living in a day and age con in, in regard to contemporary Christian Christianity where there's a strong resurging emphasis on signs and wonders. And isn't this interesting that the Lord Jesus Christ didn't give the man a sign. He didn't give a man a wonder. That was going to come once the man gets home. What he gave the man was a word communicating to us that the very best thing that Christ can give us is his word. And that's what he has done. Oh, if you have a word from Christ, wow. Man, if you have a word for Christ, you've really got something. So we have a strong emphasis on the word of God, the B-I-B-O-E, which we're accustomed to, but also don't miss the fact that this is a strong emphasis on the power that is the impact and, and uh, um, import of prayer. Because when he finds the Lord Jesus Christ and talks to him, that's prayer. And when the Lord Jesus Christ talks to him, that's the B-I-B-L-E, and we're back to you. How many times have we rehearsed that, that the, the basis of any intimate personal relationship is the constant flow of two-way communication where God talks to you through the B-I-B-L-E and where you talk to God through the wonderful medium of prayer. And here we see that established even in this second miracle that John records for us. And you have to appreciate the investigation the nobleman conducts in verses 51 and 52. I'm reading, take a look. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son lives! Then inquired, what a great word, he of them, the hour when he began to improve. And they said unto him, you're not surprised, right? Yesterday, at the 11th hour, the fever left him, exactly as Christ had said. Isn't that interesting that you and I, when we get to the end of our earthly sojourn, part of our testimony is going to be it always was exactly the way that Christ said. Again, the import of his word. But I love, and I just wanted to hover over that with you for a few moments, I love the fact that he investigates. It's kind of neat. He knows that Christ has done something special, yea, miraculous. And he's got his son back. But rather than being consumed with that and actually forgetting to fully praise the one who has done such a marvelous work, he actually becomes the investigator and he embraces what actually is a high calling on your and my life that you and I would investigate as much as we possibly can all of the details of God's gracious and merciful work in our lives and that forthcoming from that investigation is full heart, is full, heartful, how do I want to say that? Is full praise, here it is, is full praise from the heart for the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't rip him off. Make sure that he receives all the praise that is due his name. And the only way you can do that is by fully investigating. <laughs> I love that. And listen, I'm the first to recognize with you that we don't always see everything. We know that. We don't always know everything. There's a lot of things that we cannot figure out, but shame on us when there are things that we can and should figure out that we don't.
so the end we're being we're, we're being left with this powerful push for full praise to Christ for all of the grace and mercy that he showers upon us and that in turn made me think of another psalm and I'd like to take you there in the end so you're turning with me then to Psalm 111 this is so neat if you've been around then this may ring a bell uh, but that's okay Psalm 111 I, I, I love the Psalms did you know that that I love the Psalms And did you know that uh, my favorite psalm is whichever one I, has, I have read the, the latest? In Psalm 111, I would encourage you. This is, I, I love saying that to you. It's only 10 verses. I'd, tomorrow morning, if you wake up and you're wondering, boy, where should I devote myself? Well, Psalm 11, but I'm directing your attention to the first two verses. Praise ye the Lord, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, and here it is, sought out of all them who have pleasure therein. Sought out. It would be hard to express in English the passion and the persistency and the wholeheartedness and the investigatory nature of this phrase. I remember I, I, I wanted to look and see if we have actually systematically studied through Psalm 111 or if in the past I've just referenced in particularly these first two verses, but I, I remember giving you the illustration and I happily restate it and uh, do so with believing that it holds. I, I, I remember, and we, we think of this negatively initially, but re remember how you used to have to, well, we still do it, but remember how you used to take your rugs that were dirty and take your rugs out and hang them over a line and then you just would whack the thing with a, what do you call that, a rug? It's a rug whacker, yeah. A, a rug beater, you, you would take that and you just would be whacking that thing. Even our lazies, can you imagine? I, or I, I've seen my mom do a few things like that and, and it was part of the reason why I was afraid of her. Wow, whack, whack, whack. And the idea is I'm gonna get every grain of dirt out of that rug and that's the way positively it ought to be with our, with our um, investigating God's grace and mercy in our lives. We're, we're saying, I'm going to get every ounce of it out to the praise of God. I don't want to muff. I don't want to miss. I, I, I want to make sure that I am acknowledging everything that he has done. I want to make sure that I know what he has done, and then I want to make sure that I have properly praised him for what he has done. Let me leave you with this challenge. It's actually a warning, and I'm reflecting on my heart, not yours. You and I, in this earthly sojourn of ours, sometimes, and we could weep about it, sometimes it feels like we're moving just from one trial to another trial, from one trouble to another trouble, from one, from one trib to another trib. Be very, very careful. Here, here's the warning. By the way, we, we can handle that because... It's joy through and through. Listen, we will continue to sing because it continues to issue from our hearts. There's nothing like trusting the Lord, even through the dark and discouraging days. And there's a joy in that. And I understand the, uh, the, uh, the, the irony in that, but, but it's the reality of things. Joy in not only serving Jesus, but joy in trusting Jesus. But be very, very careful about moving from one traumatic thing to another where in regard to the first traumatic thing, you are driven to pray passionately and persistently for that thing. And then by the time the Lord actually wonderfully and graciously and mercifully answers that prayer, you are on to your next trauma and you forget to praise him for the outright miracle 
that has unfolded as you have petitioned him for his help. So you know what? We're leaving tonight recognizing that part of the high calling of God on our lives is to be good investigators of God's grace and mercy in our lives. That's what the nobleman did in response to Christ healing his son. He looked it all over and in turn was in a position to offer full praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. I commend to you tonight the Lord of time and distance. That's your Savior. All of God's people said to that. Lord, thank you for these considerations and wow, what a miracle. And oh God, it certainly, uh, certainly is worthy of more time and energy, but you, you know our hearts in regard to that. And again, these miracles are, are somewhat familiar to us and, and we believe we're following your, your plan in regard to the study, but wow, wow, what a miracle. And oh God, how it just applies to our hearts and lives in so many different ways. I, I, I re remember reading through and studying through this and thinking this is as much for me as it is and as it was for the nobleman and his son. What an amazing, amazing and impressive miracle. And oh God, how we worship the Lord of time and distance. We praise you tonight then in Jesus' name. Turn to 634. Oh, how I love Jesus. 634. Oh, how I love Jesus. We'll stand and sing. First verse, please. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear. The Thank you for your love. And we love you because you first loved us. And we can't get over your love, Lord. We are so undeserving of it. We thank you for all the times that you've overcome time and distance in our lives. You've worked miraculously. You've answered prayers. We thank you and praise you, Lord. And we know that you'll continue to be faithful because that's what you promised us. That's who we are to Praisers of you in front of others. Praisers of you because you deserve it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. We praise you.